I'm Ryan with the Caribbean Castaways. And before we jump into today's video, I wanna tell you guys all about the Caribbean Preferred card. This card will give you the keys to the Caribbean. It will give you access to huge discounts on hotels, restaurants, tours, charters, and even online shopping. So if you're looking to save hundreds on your next Caribbean vacation, grab a Caribbean Preferred card today at caribbeancastaways.com slash card. Thank you, cheers. John H. Cunningham, welcome to the Caribbean Castaways podcast. How's it going, man? It's going great, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, we've known each other for quite a few years now, just through our, uh, you know, Key West adventures and, you know, wherever, wherever else life takes us. But uh, it's been a pretty fun ride so far. Absolutely, man. Mutual, mutual rum friends introduced us originally. And, you know, we've had some good times together and following around uh, each other's footsteps around the Caribbean. So we got to get together on one of those trips. For sure. It's funny how rum brings people together. I, I've met the coolest people through rum and, um, you know, it's been a pretty good ride. So I'm uh, currently drinking a glass of Foxy's Firewater Rum, I like represented it. well in your book. So I can't wait to dive into that. So what are you sipping on right now? I am sipping on uh, a bitter blonde, which is a combination of some Pilar blonde and a little, uh, you know, Barrett's ginger beer. Yeah. Of course, you got to have a little bit of, you know, bitters. So, uh, cheers. Cheers, man. Yeah, we, we, I love Pilar as well. You know, totally represent our, our friends down in Key West for, for the brand. It's a, a really good brand. So, Awesome. So um, let's dive into this interview and I want to do a little icebreaker question. So tell us one thing that people might not know about John H. Cunningham. Ooh, okay. <laughs> There's a lot, but uh, let me, I'll pull one out. All right. Um, <clears throat> so one may be germane to the whole Key West history and one of the reasons I love it, but I actually moved down there when I was 18 years old in the late 1970s. I'll date myself here. You weren't even born yet. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I was a bouncer at a disco. And this was a real disco at peak of the disco era, live bands, all kind of stuff. And it was the spot in Key West for the, you know, there, there was the gay place, the monster. This was called Fitzgerald's, which was in the basement or the uh, ground level of the La Concha Hotel. Okay, cool. It was a very wild time. Very well, lots of fights, lots of police <laughs> breakups, you know, still have plenty of scars. It was, so you, uh, you actually got into some, uh, some fights <laughs> with people, huh? Oh, sad. yeah, sadly. Yeah. Well, well, I think I was 18 years old. I was really buff from, you know, I just finished playing high school football and everything. And uh, I didn't know, I didn't know that many people cause I just moved down there. So right. the manager loved the fact that I didn't know anybody cause he could point me in front of anybody and I would have no preconceived notions of, Oh, I better not mess with that person. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I was uh, lots of lots of good times. My That's... first first night there, I got into a huge fight. Guys biting my neck. I had to headbutt him to get free. Oh my the god! Manager, the manager takes me next door and goes, uh, "So, how do you like the job?" <laughs> oh, it was great. Thanks. So, <laughs> anyway, so that was your that was your first um, experience of Key West. Like, what brought you down to Key West that first time? Because I, I know it draws a lot of creative souls down there and people looking to escape and it's a very creative atmosphere is that kind of what drew you down there or you just wanted to you know see key west no i was just hell on wheels so uh i uh, i graduated from high school i grew up in maryland my father was an fbi agent up there and um through high school i was focused primarily on football and my girlfriend so when it came time to go to college, actually, fortunately, my uncle, my father's brother, lived in Miami, and I would come down uh, for the summers, and he had a place in the Keys, like Isla Mirada, and I learned to scuba dive at 13, saltwater fish, just the love for the islands, and, you know, back then, it was very uninhabited and great. Right. But when it came time to go to uh, college, and again, given my areas of focus during high school, I thought it would be good to really bone up at uh, Florida Keys Community College in Key West, <laughs> literally. literally. Right. So, <laughs> so yeah, moving down to Key West as an 18-year-old, 1978, there was a few things going on down there. It was a pretty interesting time. 
That, that's awesome. I mean, I kind of followed the same path from Kansas, but I ended up in Naples, Florida. Um, was I, I would guess obviously the population couldn't be more different as far as young and creative types versus kind of the older snowbirds. So I had a different atmosphere. I didn't get in too many fights, but uh, it was that love of the ocean and in that lifestyle that brought me down to Florida. You just ended up a little bit further south and probably a better time. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, same same thing. I mean, you, right, came, right. you came from Kansas. I came from Maryland. I mean, I was a few hours inland to come down and to be in the blue water of Florida. I mean, it's like, wow, for a, for a kid, it's like. Oh, just it you blows your mind. Right. Yeah, it. Yeah, I was, I'm still blown away by, you know, some of the things I see around here, but, um, you know, let, let's kind of get into, you know, why we're here today. So tell everybody who you are and why you wanted to become an author and kind of how your life has evolved around, you know, writing and the other things you might do in New York and how it all kind of came to be. Sure. Okay. Again, a lot to talk about there. <laughs> so, uh, I guess, it was interesting, that same uncle that introduced me to scuba diving introduced me to my first Travis McGee novel when I was 18 years old. So I wasn't a big reader at that time, but I got into that. I was like, wow, I kind of read through all 22 copies, you know, over the next couple of years. But, um, you know, I was really, um, when, when I went to, back to college in Maryland after I left Key West after a couple of years, I, I, you can only stay so long when you're, you know, at that age. Right. Uh, and when what was going on down there. So I went back to Maryland, uh, finished up my degree, and um, I started a, a business. I worked at a ski shop while I was in, um, in college, and skiing was another big passion of mine. So me and a buddy of mine started this company. It was called Resort Video Promotions, and it was really, you know, it was kind of the Betamax era of video. And we were trying to go around. I went to every ski, big ski area around the country trying to get them to create a video brochure that would create these video libraries, put them in ski shops, travel agencies, things like that, that hardly exist anymore. Uh, and it, unfortunately, it was pretty far ahead of the time. And people were really into it. Right. It was, it was really hot. So we kind of sold that business to a guy who was the uh, largest brochure distributor of ski areas around the country. So I went to work for him for a while and he had a ski magazine and I started writing stories in the ski magazine. And I, and I really liked it. And it was a lot of fun. That was up in the, in the Berkshires of Massachusetts. Okay. Well, I was up there, unfortunately, my mom passed away. And my dad wasn't doing too good. So I came back down to Maryland to see him. Went to a trade show. Met a friend of a friend who had a publishing company. And, you know, I, I went to work for these guys locally. And before long, I was the editor-in-chief of a professional photography magazine. Wow. Which I knew nothing about photography. <laughs> fortunately, we had a good staff. Um, so, you know, that's where I kind of got my love of publishing, you know, through that, um, you know, that company as most publishing companies do didn't, you know, didn't survive for unfortunately. And the only other publishing job I looked at at that time was to be senior editor of powder magazine, which would have been a pretty good gig. Right. Right. Totally but, cool. You know, fortunately, probably in hindsight, they didn't hire me. <laughs> I went for an interview up in Vermont and didn't work out. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so then I got into commercial real estate. So I've been doing commercial real estate for 30 years, but I always had that love of writing. And I wrote my first novel, you know, back in 1990 and wrote three or four other novels before I started the Buck Riley series. And now, you know, I've been primarily focused on writing the Buck Riley series, which is a eight book series that takes place in Key West and around the Caribbean. I, w I was kind of wondering, that was going to be one of my, I think, questions I was going to get into is like, was you know, the Buck Riley Caribbean Adventure series won your first, you know, book, but like rarely there's authors usually have, you know, a, a hidden kind of like treasure trove of notes and half written books and unpublished books, but you had actually published some books before Buck, the Buck Riley series. Well, I wrote several books. Before okay. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any formal training. I mean, I was like to write in college and as a kid and all that, but again, it wasn't really my forte. So I learned a lot, you know, I learned a lot. I, I got, a, I got my first agent through Shakespeare and company in Paris, which is a long story. Um, she taught me a lot of stuff. Um, I wrote several books and then worked with editors and they taught me a lot. And, you know, I think I literally wrote four books and I had another agent who's really, you know, a, a really top-notch agent. And he's like, look, 
people like series, first of all. And, you know, you have to write what you know and love, you know, because I was writing kind of different standalone books. And he's like, what, people, what really sells are these series. That's what people want. So I said, all right, what do I know and love? Let's see, I know Key West. You know, I knew flying boats because I was taking flying lessons at the time. And I, you know, Jimmy Buffett music and sure, all that. Sure, sure. You know, the Caribbean. I'd been all around the Caribbean. Love that. So kind of, you know, and I also wanted to create something that was like a everyman protagonist, you know, not somebody who's got a lot of money, who's got, you know, special agent skills or is a Navy SEAL or something, you know, they're never in jeopardy. Buck Riley is always in jeopardy. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I want when people to read that, I want them to think about, well, gee, I mean, that's probably what I would do. That was stupid. Why, why would he do that? You know, you know get his heart broken, get his, you know, nose broken, whatever, but figure it out and not give up. Right. So, you know, so that's kind of where some of that came from. That, that's, that's totally awesome. So, you know, I've, I've read all the books and like I mentioned to you before in our, uh, like kind of preparation conversation, I'm about halfway through the very last book. And to me, it's like, he is in every man. And I actually see him, I might date myself a little bit too. I'm older than you think I am, <laughs> but I, I kind of see him as a Indiana Jones and kind of a um, Magnum PI. Yeah, so he, totally. he like, he wants to like solve the problems, you know, fix the crime, but he's also like, he's the treasure hunter. And he's like, you know, he's got that, that thing where it travels all over the world, which makes it super, super interesting. And um then again, he's like the, the beach bum, almost like a Matthew McConaughey. For some reason, like <laughs> I, I picture Buck with kind of like, you know, salty hair, almost like a, a crusty Matthew McConaughey. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, a lot of people have said that to me. They're like, oh, Matthew McConaughey would be great to play Buck Riley. I, I, it's so funny. That, that would be great. But no, it's so funny that you connected with like a Indiana Jones and a Magnum. I mean, of course, I was a huge Magnum fan when it was out originally. Love that series. And Indiana Jones and actually another a Matthew McConaughey movie, Fool's Gold. I don't know if you ever saw oh, that. Oh, yeah. Love it. Love it. Some of those were kind of the thinking behind how do I create this character? I want him to have kind of the, the smarts and the archaeological background of like an Indiana Jones. And, you know, Indy got beat up. He got captured. He's, you know, but he prevailed. You know, Magnum had a little bit of the swagger and lived in the tropical location. So yeah, definitely a combination of those things. And then Fool's Gold, that, that was just a fun movie. He's not quite as dumb as Matthew McConaughey was in that movie. <laughs> right, right. Movie, but it was a fun treasure hunting movie in the Caribbean with a lot of characters. And, you know, you're reading White Knight right now, you know the local characters I'm talking about. I mean, I, I love going to all the different islands and having history, but also having a lot of local people. And I have a lot of real people that actually be in the books, but and kind of represent them and they're they're you know often the hero or whatever else but help buck out so that that's a lot of fun that yeah it's it's so cool i was reading um i believe it was um the dark the dark knight uh no um which one is the dark one free fall to black there we oh, go black. i loved free fall to black and we'll kind of get into these a little bit more but that to me was like the how you set up the entire thing and going back to your using of real places and real characters, uh, I was reading that book and a name for one of the lawyers came up and it was Carlton Grooms, who we, we both know and uh, call a friend. And I was like, you know, that, I, it's just like, I, I read that and it just kind of made me feel all warm and fuzzy. And it's just like, that's awesome when an, an author can like interweave, you know, real life people and real life places into a fictional story. And it makes you feel just that much more connected to what's going on in the story. I love it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually why I do that. I mean, for me, it's a lot of fun to put friends in and, you know, I've had a lot of musicians and even politicians and things like that. Um, but to your point, I mean, I think it, it gives a different texture. It's not, I mean, you know, it's fiction. You know, this stuff's not happening, but wow, now all of a sudden there's people I know in here, whether it's a friend or like I had Jimmy Buffett in my third book and that it's not easy to get his permission to put him in something, but he agreed based on the book to be in it. And also had in that same book, Matt Hoggett, you know, Tom Shepard and Scott Kirby. And, uh, and Matt and I actually wrote the ballad of Buck Riley, which kind of played out at the end of that book. <clears throat> um, but 
you know, that, that to me that, you know, gives this combination of fiction and nonfiction together because these larger than life characters, whether they're musicians or whoever, you know, they're just a lot of fun to put in and they get a kick out of it. Right. Yeah. But the reader also really identifies, especially if you're, again, for your, you know, clients and friends who travel the Caribbean, if you're going to Anguilla, say, well, oh, gee, I'm going to see Banky Banks. I want to go to the Doom Preserve and see Banky Banks. Right. You know, Banky Banks was in, you know, uh, Second Chance Gold. Uh, so I went and hung out with him there. And, you know, he's sitting there with a big bowl of grass the whole time I'm there just rolling babies the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, that's the islands, man. It's, it, it's so cool how, you know, that all kind of comes together in the stories. But um, I want to jump back into um, Buffett just a little bit because I know um, he has a love of flying boats, as do you. And the flying boats um, come up in your stories all the time. It's almost like another character in the story. Um, I'm a big aviation fan as well. And so when you ask Buffett, you know, for permission to be in the, in the stories, he obviously probably read the manuscript. Did, was he, was he like, you know, this is, this is freaking awesome. Like great storytelling. Like this is me. If I could, if I wasn't doing music, would he be like that kind of pirate? <laughs> great question. Yeah. I wish that were the case. I was dealing with his agent, Howard Kaufman. Okay. And who's now, unfortunately, deceased, and uh, a lady named uh, Nina Avramides who worked for them, and and she was great. I mean, Jimmy, you know, we we all, you know, I've met him a few times at, in different charity events or shows or whatever. Uh, actually, a couple of funny times, but anyway, he's an amazingly busy guy. You know, he's got a huge empire, and uh, I don't know if he's read the books or not. I mean, I know he read these sections. Okay. They to say, okay. Show me where he is, and they change it. They made we don't want to say this, have him say this. So that was kind of fun. It was a cool process, but um, pretty much every other real person I've had in has, has really kind of you know gotten into it and and wanted to make you know again personalize it for their for their own. For their yeah, own. yeah. I've I've recommended your books a lot to people um, when they're traveling down to the islands. <clears throat> so you know if you're sitting on let's say Maho Bay, St. John. And I'm like, hey, go read this book by John H. Cunningham. And all of a sudden, it takes you into, you know, somebody getting beat up at the beach bar and then, you know, planes flying over all the beaches and through the, you know, the sound over to the BVI. It's just like, if you're actually there, you know, and you're walking through, you're actually walking through the story. So I always say, okay, if you're going to the, this island, you know, read about this one. If you're going to Key West, read about this one. So it's, it's, it's a very cool experience. I want everybody to know that, you know, you, your writing process. So I kind of want to get into that next is, is because you use these real places, these real characters, you, your research process. I, I think you use this as an excuse to go down to the islands, <laughs> as do I, as do I. But like, you get to go down there to like, say, you know, St. John or St. Bart's or Anguilla and you research these characters and you're looking at the street names and you're looking at the specific beaches and yeah. kind of take people into your research process and um, how you develop the story, whether it's, um, do, you, do you have the story in your mind before you go to the, the setting, the, the, where the, the location is at, or how does it all evolve? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, you know, there, there's kind of two types of writers out there. One, they call themselves pantsers. They fly by the seat of their pants and they just kind of write as they go, which I don't know, I mean, I, that would be interesting, but I really get so much detail and I try to do a lot of research, so I don't think I can do that and be efficient. So I kind of outline my book. So I do think ahead of time, you know, and it's not just like, all right, I'm going to go to St. John now, write a story. I'll, I'll have to kind of be doing research in a number of different areas and something about that has to get my attention and, and, and kind of what I want to talk about. Um, so, you know, that, that it, there's a lot of research that goes into it. And then I kind of really make a, an outline and I try to go to your point to every place I write about. I mean, why not? Cause right. I do, like, you know, I, I kind of think of it almost like a fictional lonely planet. You know, somebody reads my books and there's been people who you know, like gone around and checked all the different beach bars or That's cemeteries awesome. or, you know, whatever, you know, police stations, jails, whatever of, of where the characters may wind up, usually Buck. Um, so, so, you know, that, that's kind of fun. And I want people who, 
have been to these places to identify with what they're seeing, you know, say, hey, I've been there, oh, I know exactly where that is. Or people who dream about going there to say, wow, I wanna check it out. And kind of like back to my resort video promotion idea, which was to put forth, here's, here's Aspen. Here's everything about Aspen, check it out. And then you're gonna look at that and say, wow, I wanna go there. Same kind of concept with the book. You know, I wanna to go to you know, St. Bart's, I wanna to go to you know, Jamaica, and I'm gonna read this book. I'm like, wow, I really get it. Right. It's cool. Yeah, it, it's so cool. Like, you know, Crystal and I as travel bloggers, like we, so we kind of, we wanna tell a story of, you know, the location, you know, in a more obviously real kind of sense, but like we, we almost do it on a selfish, you know, way a little bit. So like, if we're gonna to go to St. Bart's or St. Martin or wherever, you know, I'll reach out and start to form a, basically a media plan or something like that of what hotels I want to contact. And I'm going to, and I'm going to kind of put together a proposal for all these different places, but it's, it is because I want to tell the readers and the listeners a story about this, you know, location, because in, in the end, I want everybody to go to these places and experience them like we get to, but like, mm -hmm you know, I also want to go there myself. And like, you know, so I have to contact all these places and say, Hey, you know, I need to do some research on your hotel. And of course they're happy to have you and stuff like that. So it's, it's a pretty cool gig. <laughs> you, you and Crystal are smarter than me though, Ryan. I just, I just spend the money to go down there and, and uh, I don't get paid for that kind of stuff. So I, you're kudos to you guys, but well, I mean, you do in the, you do in the back end though. So the back end, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So very um, cool. So um, like you mentioned earlier, the, the Buck Rally series is eight books and I do want to get into the last raft as well. So that, that's a different, that's a new departure that you've done. I definitely want to check that out, but I'm going to do something here and it's been a while since I read some of the first books. So I want to see you correct me if I mess any of these up, but I think I got them. So red, right, return key West yep. green to go cuba kind of like the main settings right yeah that's um right. crystal blue bvi usvi right second chance gold kind of saint bart's yeah saint bart's in okay England. maroon mm. rising i loved maroon rising jamaica yeah uh free fall to black pre kind of like new york city um the mexican jungle you know yeah. love free that one as well yeah. um silver goodbye oh it's been a while since I read that one. Um, help me out with that one. That was during Hurricane Irma in Key West. Yes. Yes. I, I love that you brought in the storms because yeah. especially as a Floridian, that, that really made it kind of hit home and you can kind of figure out like what was happening during the storms. Right. And then White Knight um, is happening in the BVI and USVI right now. And I can't wait to finish that one. Yeah. But well, um, back to the BVI in the oh in God, the I, I cannot wait. And unfortunately, like they open up December first, and you know, not to get political or anything, but they like came up with some super strict restrictions on getting back in. So I hope um, I really want the businesses to thrive, and I want people to get back over there and get back to normal. But I think we all do. So yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that is going to probably be impossible to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. So if you had to pick one of your favorite Buck Riley books, which one would it be and why? It's like asking like, what kid do you love? I know, but yeah, right. Well, I mean, you just kind of went through all of them and I'll, I'll touch on each one kind of real quick, just to kind of give you my thoughts. Yeah. But I mean, red was the first one. And again, that was. Red Right Return starts when Buck Riley had lost everything, which happens in Free Fall to Black, which is a prequel, which doesn't happen until book six. Right, loved it. And yeah. you know a lot of people, you know a lot of backstory. So it's kind of cool to have it as a later book. So anyway, he, he gets his life going in, in red, but everything's falling apart for him because he's trying to be under the radar and everybody finds him and he's like, oh shit, it's not going how I wanted it to. Cuba. I love that book because I love Cuba and hence my latest book, The Last Raft. Um, <clears throat> and he has some problems with his one old airplane and maybe finds another old airplane. Um, so, I, you know, that one's pretty cool. Crystal Blue, again, Buffett, Hoggett, Holy Ballad of Buck Riley. I mean, super fun writing that. Um, you know, uh, Second Chance Gold. Uh, I dedicated that to Maria Stackleborough, who... You know, he, he was the, as you know, he was the, uh, he, he created La Select down there. It was the first bar in St. Bart's. 
sweetest guy you ever known. I mean, he passed away earlier this year at 95. Um, really good guy. We spent a lot of time together at his house and at the bar and dinner. I was down there like six years, five, six years ago. It was my birthday. His birthday is also in June. We went to Eddie's, his son's restaurant, had champagne, had a big time. Just the nicest guy in the world. So I dedicated that book to him. He was still alive at the time. Banky Banks was in it. Also a great book. Uh, and actually, funny, I wrote it about, we met Ross Perot's nephew in a previous trip to St. Bart's who gave me the idea for the character in that book. Oh, wow. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so after that was um, Maroon, and Maroon was amazing to me because I got to go meet Chris Blackwell. And if for those of you who don't know who Chris Blackwell is, he founded Island Records, discovered Bob Marley, discovered U2, Bono, he was on the plane with Buffett when Buffett got shot at and then he wrote Jamaica Mistake along with Bono. Bono. And, uh, you know, I hung out with Chris at GoldenEye, a, a resort he owns. I went to his other resort at Strawberry Hill and nicest guy in the world. You know, so I'm in New York after that as well. So that was really special to hang out with him. And he gave me ideas to use in the book while I was researching the Maroons and everything. So also very special. Um, then, you know, Free Fall, you know, that was cool because it was the... Uh, you know, the prequel, Silver, Silver, you know, Silver Goodbye took place, you know, I wrote it just after Irma and, you know, we had a home in Key West, a lot of friends up the Keys, really, you know, lost a lot. It was really tough. So I wanted to write something really true to that storm and what it did to people. But I wove in kind of stories from the 70s and some of my old friends, you know, some drug smuggling details, things like that, that uh, kind of made that interesting and personal as well. Um, and then uh, White Knight after that, and you know, White Knight, I got to hang out with Foxy, and he appears in my book. I was this close to having Kenny Chesney appear, but I ran out of time while he was re reading it. Yeah, uh, That was kind of a bummer, but uh, so, I mean, hard to pick a favorite one because for me, it's all about the process too. I mean, you know, the stories are, are, are different in, in Buck, you know, the character art changes over time. I mean, that's what has to happen in a series. I mean, not only Buck, but all the characters you know, some are doing better, some are doing worse. So anyway, um, long answer to your question, Ryan. I don't know, maybe White Knight. I mean, White Knight's the latest one. That was a lot of fun to, to write, you know, and I really like that story, so. Cool, I, I know it's an impossible question, but thank you for like taking <laughs> us through it. And, and a lot of times, like when I was um, preparing and researching for this, this interview, this podcast, I really, I, because I'm, I do get really excited about the books and I really love the character, and I was like trying to refrain from saying too much about the actual storylines. I'm like, well, he, he started off on Tortola and then he went to King Garden Bay and he had to get over to Yost and this Peter Bay on St. John. I was like, I, was like I, I can't say all that because I have to leave something for the reader. But that's how like excited I was to like get into the stories. And, and I know anybody who picks up the Buck Riley series will be the same way because castaways are castaways they're salty souls and i i feel like buck is definitely one of those people oh yeah no he's he's one of your fans <laughs> cool he's cool. got the swag <laughs> <laughs> so let's dive into um the last raft a little bit um i haven't read this book so it's a complete mystery to me but without giving too much away you know tell us about maybe why you wanted to get away from buck a little bit um and, and kind of that story behind it. Yeah, so it's, it's actually an interesting uh, story. So um, I actually wrote most of The Last Raft 20 years ago. It was okay. Four bucks. It was the first time I went to Cuba. I went there. I actually got a license to go under the second Bush administration because back then it was a lot harder than it is today. Um, and I went down there to research what, mul what you know, came multiple books because I've had Red had Cuba, Green had Cuba, this, so, I mean, Cuba is just kind of an interesting place. But, you know, I mean, I love islands. I love the people there. You know, I love um, a lot about it. What I don't love is, you know, their plight. I mean, it, you know, Fidel totally abused them. I mean, it, it's interesting when, when Fidel, at the time that book was set in 2001, hit, Forbes estimated his net worth at $900 million. Crazy. <laughs> Crazy, you know, and, that, and that's that. all. That's the that's the Cubans' money, yeah. right? I mean, the yeah. Cubans are starving. You know, the Russians are giving them money to the Soviet Union back in the day. 
etc. You know, Fidel was squirreling it away for himself, and they endured what they called the special period, which was, you know, they were starving. I mean, they wouldn't, they'd go wait in line all day at the bodega hoping to get, a, you know, maybe a chicken or a loaf of bread. So, I mean, sadly, those people have been through a lot. And I mean, the people who Fidel nationalized all their properties have been through a lot too. And there's nobody more vehement, as we saw in yesterday's election, about, uh, you know, Cuba and, and then the Cuban Americans. I mean, the last thing they want to have happen is the embargo end. But after 60 years, it's just not working. So the, the point of the last raft, it, it goes back, it's, it's more like an alternative ending, kind of like a, uh, um, you know, a, you know, um, Quentin Tarantino without all the violence concept, because he would do these, you know, alternate ending type stories. So it goes back to 2001, you know, before 9-11. And, you know, the president at the time, it's all fictitious, of course, you know, is negotiating to try to end the embargo. And then a couple senators who have special interests and they get a lot of money, you know, they don't want that to happen. So they sabotage it. Meanwhile, there's been a huge boat lift of 50, you know, 50,000 people have left Cuba related to the senators sabotaging the steel. And they're all being held in a tent city in Miami. And the story kind of follows the political side, it's multiple point of view, with five people who leave on the last raft. You know, and meanwhile, while they're going through their, you know, hellish journey from Havana to Key West, um, there's all this political wrangling and negotiating happening at the same time. So it's, uh, it's very different than Buck. You know, it's a standalone book. You know, there, there won't be a sequel. <laughs> I'd like there to be a sequel of, you know, Cuba Changed and Opened Up. But um, so it's just something that is kind of is near and dear to my heart. Um, it, it's not going to be, you know, quote, as quote, as big as the Buck series or things like that. But it's a good story. In fact, I had a lot of uh, comments from people in Miami who were like, this story needs to be told. It's really interesting. And, and there's, there's some humor. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's an adventure of a different kind. Uh, but it's more of a novel. So. Gotcha. No. Yeah, Cuba to me is, I haven't been there personally yet. And um, it just looks like such a fascinating culture and i i know there's you know the poverty and like how you know none of the buildings are you know taken care of but to me i think that's part of the charm and part of the nostalgia of the place and then you know even just getting away from havana and into the countryside and stuff like that and and i it's just a place i i love exploring the off the beaten path type places places like I mean, the rest of the world can go to Cuba, but like we can't. So it makes me terribly like jealous, but like, it's just because of that, that aspect, I, I want to experience and that. And hopefully, you know, whatever political situation happens in the future for us, like, I, I really hope that, you know, things open up and, you know, we get to experience it and the Cuban people get to experience the U.S. and things start moving, you know, freely and life improves for everybody. But yeah. it's um, it's a neat concept. I, I can't wait to dive into the last raft. Yeah, I think I mean, it's a it's a cool story. I'm proud of it. <clears throat> you know, it's a you know, I think it's something that needs to be told because most Americans never think about Cuba. And we don't you know, we don't think about the people we don't think about. It's just not ever been on our radar screen. Right. Literally 60 years. It's been a void. So, you know, it's too bad because you're right. I mean, that city is amazing. Havana is a 500-year-old city. Christopher Columbus's nephew was the first governor of Havana. It's crazy. Hey, and the architecture is amazing. And UNESCO did actually spend, you know, over a billion dollars there probably 30 years ago. So Havana Vieja, the old part of Havana, is amazing. But, you know, I wanted to go there. I wanted to go to Hemingway's house and, you know, I've kind of followed him around a little bit from Cuba to Paris and and uh, and Key West, of course. So, um, you know, it, it's just a, it's a fascinating place. How how many nights did you spend walking down the the Melikon? <laughs> well, I just stayed not too far from there. Um, we were there for a few weeks. I mean, I made it a good trip, and uh, you know, and we traveled around. We went out to Veradero, did a little bit out in the, in, the, in the west also, and. And check that out. I mean, I'm dying to go back. I have some friends in Key West who go there all the time. So, you know, I want to go back again and just, you know, not research, just enjoy. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> but that, that, yeah, yeah that, that's awesome. That's, that's really awesome. Um, yeah. So <laughs> kind of getting into more of the, the author aspect, because we're both, 
you know, kind of writers, you're way much more, you know, refined and like famous than I am. But like, because, you know, I believe in the power of words as well. Like I'm, I'm sure you do as well. You know, tell us what was an early experience where you learned that like language had power as an author, because like, I believe that storytelling is, is so powerful. It creates value. It can create regimes. It can end regimes. It, it's so cool. And not to get too like nerdy on you, but like, when did you like feel like wow, language and, and all this stuff really had power to, to do things? Yeah, no, another cool question. Um, you know, thinking about it, I mean, again, I was a child of the sixties and seventies and, uh, you know, I'll give you a couple of connections to language, but one of which, I mean, there was a lot of racism back in those days, you know, and I have some of my best friends in elementary school were black kids and I never thought anything about it. And then all of a sudden we got in a, in junior high school or high school and there was like this weird thing going on where there was this, you know, kind of racism between people. I was like, what the heck? And I saw the, the hurtfulness of those words, you know, which again, I think probably, probably more than half of the, the characters in my books are, are black people. I'd, I'd say African-American, but they're from the Caribbean or Jamaica, or they're all over the place. Right. You know, and they are, you know, I, I hope to well, you know, represent them well. Um, another kind of word connection would be, you know, and this, I realized this, I think while I was writing White Knight, um, one of my family's things we would do when we were kids was watch Jacques Cousteau's Undersea World. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I mean, love it Jacques. Show, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's where I got my love of scuba diving. I was saying I got certified when I was 13 and that whole French flair, you know, on the boat with the people are all drinking wine and smoking <laughs> cigarettes. And Jack was just this little guy, but his words, I mean, it was so eloquent and it wasn't even his first language. He was just such a good speaker, but that really, that whole story with his words just kind of really put me in another mental dimension. And then, then I'd say I tie that together as a writer with, um, Ernest Hemingway, who always said he was just always searching for the perfect sentence. You know, he would he would write a beginning or an ending of a book 30 times because he's just looking for the right words. Right. You really have that perfect sentence is how he always put it. So I think, you know, you kind of pull all those things together and um, it, it's a little bit of, you know, what kind of drives me because it's it's my books are very dialogue driven. I don't do, you know, because it's sort of adventure, my editors have always whittled away at too much description and too many other things. You want, you want the people to envision it, think about it. Don't, right. don't describe somebody, let them think about it. So you have to be really selective on the words you use for that. So finding the one right word for that and then have the, you know, the story be told via the dialogue and the actions of people and show, don't tell. So, you know, I have to I have to show them through their actions, not say, hey, you know, Buck sits down and he crosses his legs and he takes a sip of his Pilar Rum. It's like, no, I mean, you have to say that a different way. Right, right. So the reader feels like they're there. I mean, that's, I've always said that, you know, once you see the world through Buck's eyes, it won't look the same because I really want it to be like you're in the room with him or in the plane or, you know, in the islands or in the fight or whatever it may be. So you're really experiencing that. So you really have to choose the words, you know, very, very carefully. I, I like that. And, and you touched on Hemingway a little bit who, you know, we're drinking his rum and, you know, we love that story. He, he was a very unique, you know, adventure driven, you know, soul. And um, I, I, we went to the, his, um, the Hemingway museum there in Key West a couple of years ago. And, you know, I've been going to Key West for years and years and years and years, but I was like, I'd never been to the museum before. We actually talked to some of the guys there and um, one of the historians was like, Hemingway, you know, they showed us his writing room. They actually took us behind the gate. And I got some really cool pictures by the, um, with a cat by the uh, typewriter. It was, it's epic. I still get goosebumps thinking about it to this day. But um, he said, like, on average, like, Hemingway would only write about 300 words per day because he was so obsessive about his the story and what he was actually writing. And me as a blogger, it's like, I, I can't, it's totally different in that kind of space because we, we hammer out the content to inform people. Like I could write a thousand words in an hour. Like it's just <laughs> crazy, but like, it's nowhere like, you know, telling a story like that. So kind of going to your, um, your methods, you know, when you sit down to write, 
are you looking to, you know, write a lot? Are you, are you kind of just wanting to get a certain thing out? Like, do you have a set methodology when you sit down and write? It depends on what my wife is doing. <laughs> my Good time answer. Like that. Good answer. <laughs> so I'm out here in my writing barn. We live at a 250 year old house in Virginia, you know, which is a cool old property. Um, and that we, that I spent a lot of time in Key West also in our house down there, but, um, I try to sneak at her as much as I can and write, but I also have a, like a little nook in my bedroom, like in my closet area where I've got this desk and I'll sit there and I'll sneak in. I'll just be right. <laughs> I mean, hours can go by, you know, cause you get lost in the story. And I mean, as whether I'm writing it or reading it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're lost in this, you know, creation. Um, so I, I wish, uh, I, I'm probably closer to Hemingway on average, unfortunately, just because I've got a lot of other things I'm doing. Um, but I mean, it's crazy. I have friends who are writing three to five books a year. I mean, they're trying to put out a book like every three months. I'm like, that's crazy. I, don't know how to do it. I mean, it's not that you couldn't produce that much, but to, to be creative and have them be good is like, was like man, that, that'd be a challenge. Right. So I, I, for me, it's like a big deal. I just want to do one book, book a year. If I totally retired and give up everything else, maybe two or three, but we'll see. Gotcha. No, that's super cool. I was, I was really fascinated about your, your processes, but um, um, because the, you know, the Buck Riley series is such a, you know, a, a unique story that takes you all over the world. You know, what do you, like when you started that, did you, was it just a creative outlet for you? Did you have any kind of aspirations of being like, I want this to turn into uh, like a huge thing and sell a million books or get a movie deal? Or was it just a, I really want to tell a story and, you know, I don't care if it sells five copies. I think this is going to be entertaining. And it was, it's a very much a creative outlet for me. Like, did you have an end game in, in sight? Yeah. So, I mean, I, uh, I, you know, I frankly don't do it for the numbers. I mean, I'm not in it to make a ton of money and all that. You know, I'm more, it's funny, I've talked to people about this and, uh, you know, like, you know, I do it for me as much as anybody else. I mean, I, I, I just so enjoy the process and the creativity and the research and everything we're talking about here, Right. you know, and to create, you know, a really kind of quality story and product about places that people love to go and that they want to read and enjoy. I mean, that I really enjoy. Um, you know, the books have done well, that's great. That's, you know, again, I don't do it for the money per se. Um, I have had the Buck series optioned once and I'm actually working with somebody right now on uh, screenplays, which is something else I'm kind of interested in doing. Um, so that's kind of fun. And I think in this day and age, it's funny, uh, <laughs> a guy named Steve Golan, who was the CEO of a company called Anonymous Content. They're a big movie production company. They like Revenant, Spotlight, all these great movies. He unfortunately passed away last year of cancer, but you know, I was having lunch with him one time and he was saying, I was saying, Steve, everything's so dark now. I mean, cause Buck's not super dark. The Buck's pretty light, you know, right. you know it's fun. It's challenging. You know, it's not like evil. Um, and he's like, yeah, dark's not going away, man. Everybody likes dark, you know, I'm like, okay. Cause I was, that was, you know, gauging whether it would be popular for television. Now, however, since we live in such a dark world, people need to be uplifted. Yeah, they're looking for something a little more uplifting. So, you know, to your point in, in good, you know, connection with like the Magnum thing, it's almost like that's what they're saying. I mean, you know, make Buck like it's almost like a Magnum type story. Um, so, yeah, hopefully something like that will come together. But, you know, that's just, this is part of the creative process. I mean, I love the creative process. So, you know, it's all good. I, I love it. And, um, you know, you know, go through Buck's, you know, series. It is totally a... Um, it's a, it's an adventure series. It's like, yeah, there's some fights and there's some shooting, but like he always gets the hot girl and it always turns out pretty good. It's like, it's a feel good adventure series. So like, and it takes you to these amazing paradise locations. So it's like, I mean, when you get, when you start reading a book, it literally just kind of sucks you in. So it's like, it can't help but make you feel happy and, and good. So yeah. awesome. It's awesome. Well, one thing about that uh, worth mentioning that I didn't think about it before, but you know, being the everyman, I mean, Buck does never kills anybody in these books. And he, you know, he, it was funny. I used to have people say, 
Buck needs to get lucky, man. What's going on? He's got all these pretty girls in here. He's kind of off scene. I need some action in the book. So White Knight's a little spicier than <laughs> maybe that's why you like it. <laughs> you might be right. There's definitely some 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 sexy love scenes in there, but uh, so maybe the ladies will like it too. Who knows? <laughs> but um, so the last raft just came out fairly recently. Um, do you have anything else in the pipeline or have you put Buck Riley to bed? Are you planning on a different type of series? What were your plans? No, no. I, you know, Buck and his friends are, you know, part of my family. So, uh, no, I'm halfway through book number nine right now. Awesome. Um, starts out in Key West in COVID, you know, which I'm not going to play up a lot of COVID because we'll be not wanting to think about it when it's all gone, hopefully. Um, but uh, so, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a fun book. And, and Buck makes the decision he wants to get back into treasure hunting again. So, oh. so yeah, it's a little bit of a departure for him. And then, of course, this is, this is a writing device, which I'll share with you. You're never allowed to let your protagonist have what he wants. So they're always, they have an idea, I want to do this. And then you have to hit him with a, you throw as many rocks at him as possible. He can't get what he wants. So he's going to be treasure hunting. It may not be his idea. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. But it's a, it's a pretty fun story. I'm pretty excited about it. Awesome. I, I can't wait to dive into it. Is there a, is there a color involved? Ah, good question. Uh, it's not final yet, but I'm thinking it's indigo. So okay. you're, you're the only one I've told. Okay, cool. <laughs> So I, I think only I think only two people listen to our podcast. So who knows? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Tell Crystal not tell anybody. <laughs> well, awesome, John. Um, it's been fantastic having you on the on the show. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, if we have inspired anybody to buy these books, which I hope we have, because if if they are a fan of the Caribbean, they love traveling the islands and and going to unique locations, these books definitely take them there in a very unique way and, and with a great, great story. How can, they, how can they buy their books? How can they learn more about you? Thank you for asking that. Uh, these days, 80% of books are sold on Amazon. So all my stuff is on Amazon under John H. Cunningham. You can go to my website at jhcunningham.com and get a link to the site. Or if you hate Amazon, which some people do, you can call Sue's Orchard at Key West Island Books. She's got all the books. She will be happy to send one to you, or you can write me directly, and I'll personalize one and send it to you. But awesome. they're all pretty much on, you know, Amazon's really, unfortunately, the way to go nowadays, especially in these times when you're, you know, not supposed to be going to stores. <laughs> right, right. Well, awesome. I, um, I really appreciate having you on here today, and uh, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to hopefully uh, having a, a rum in Key West with you soon. Looking forward to it, Ryan. Great to see you. Say hi to Crystal and look forward to seeing you in Key West or further south. Sounds good, man. Cheers. Take care.